Mountain Church family. This is Pastor Jason. I'm not able to be with you this morning, but I did want to just uh, send a greeting to you and just tell you how excited I am about what happened last Sunday as we gathered for worship. Record attendance for us here at Living Hope for an Easter service or any service for that matter. And it was just so cool, so uh, encouraging to so, see so many lives come and, and give praise to our God. Now, this morning we're beginning a new series and I'm excited that Pastor David is going to be able to set this up for us as we look at what do, what do the Gospels say about the kingdom of God. And so uh, I'm going to be praying for you this morning. I'm very excited that you're going to have this teaching. Something I wanted to let you know that I'm also very excited and really grateful is probably a better word is for Pastor Benny. Pastor Benny is celebrating 20 years of service here at Living Hope. And so I want to encourage you to encourage him. Let him know how much you love him. Uh, send him a, a card and, and just and just say, hey, Benny, thanks for your service. Let him know how much you, you appreciate him. And go ahead and get signed up. Pastor Benny is leading us in, in care for our city this upcoming Saturday. And so hopefully you've seen an email or two or seen something on social media. Be sure and get signed up for our, our cleanup of our city as we give care to our city this this upcoming weekend again know that i'm praying for you and anticipating god doing a great work today well good morning living hope thank you for being here this morning are you excited about a new day to worship and celebrate your god amen would you stand with us as we begin our time of worship father we ask for your um, indwelling in the praises of your people lord we know that you inhabit that and so we ask that you would this morning would you show up and show off in an awesome way, God? We want to bring you great praise today, knowing that you are our hope, you are our salvation, you are our rescue, God. So we declare that in your name. Amen. Let's sing this together. There is a song I know. Oh, rest my confidence. 
guys can have a seat for just a moment. How many show of hands can attest to God's faithfulness this morning? Amen. Hold, hold them up, keep them up. I want everybody to look around if you can. You see all these hands raised. What that shows, that's a testament to your faithfulness of an almighty God. And we gather in a corporate setting like this, not only to give God praise and to learn and study the word of God, but we gather so that we can encourage each other as well. And having a beautiful weekend like what we've had this weekend, it's easy to be able to come and many of us are on the mountaintops. We've seen God's faithfulness. We're experiencing his faithfulness here and now. We've seen his provision and we're able to stand confidently and boldly in that. But there are some, and I'll confess, I'm one of them, who are coming out of a tough week and life has hit you hard. And we sing songs about hope in the name of Jesus and the faithfulness of our God in the past and we're looking at our present going, God, I've been praying, I've been begging, I've been pleading, and it seems awfully quiet. But our God is the same God yesterday, today, and forever. Our God's faithfulness never changes. He has a plan for us. He knows exactly what we need and when we need it. And it's our responsibility to trust him in that. So this morning, no matter what situation you're dealing with, no matter what kind of baggage or burden that you've brought into this room, whether you're on a high mountaintop and you're able to sing these songs with a heart of gratitude and celebration, or if you're walking through the valley of the shadow of death and these songs aren't so much celebration as much as they are your heart's cry, God, be my hope. Be my faithfulness. Be faithful. Sustain me. Provide. Whatever your circumstance, know that your God loves you more than anything you will ever understand in this lifetime. And His promises are true and nothing can take that away do you believe that this morning amen if you know these songs go ahead and sing it with them yes. when this life is overwhelmed and I feel like Do all you've promised, there will always be enough. When the world around me crumbles, and it's hard to understand, I will run to you, my shell.
Father, what a promise that is. Lord, you know the stories that are coming to this room this morning. Some of them are good. They're just normal weeks. But some others, Lord, are, are full of difficulties and heartache and questions that are unanswered and crises that are being faced. Father, you know those things. We have all kinds of options that are presented to us about what we can do. Lord, with the disciples, they say, where are we going to go? Where else are we going to go but to you? What are we going to do but trust you? Our heart and our flesh may fail, but God, you are the strength of our hearts. You are our portion forever. You are the one who we will trust and depend on to be our strength in our weakness. So, Father, we do pray you would do your work of comforting today and guiding and reminding us again of your presence, of your promises, and your goodness. And Father, we pray now you would teach us from your word, and we're grateful for that. In the name of Jesus, amen. Amen. Well, if I have a chance to meet you, my name is David Head. I serve as lead pastor for ministries and spiritual formation here. And we're so glad that you're all here today, especially if you are a guest with us today. Thank you so much for coming. And maybe it's your first time or your first time in a long while. We'd sure love uh, to be able to share uh, with you. And so if you wouldn't mind, take a moment. You can find a card there in the pew in front of you. Or you can uh, use the QR code there. Take a little picture of that. And you can fill out that a guest card there. Take it back here to, to our, our guest center out right in the middle of our lobby out here. We would love to be able to welcome you. We have a special gift for you. Give you any more information about our church, our faith family that you might desire. We really are glad that you're here with us today. We're excited about what God is doing among us. Pastor Jason mentioned uh, our time last Sunday. We've had several of the last few weeks who have followed the Lord in baptism. And we've seen and celebrated with these with Keegan Jenkins with Ellie Myers, Lauren Roby, Madeline Jensen, and we have others that we know are being baptized today. And every week we're seeing those who are following the Lord in baptism and signaling a change of life, a change of their destiny. We're excited to be a part of that and what the Lord has in mind for us at that point. And so we're glad uh, that we can celebrate in that way about those. Well, as you may have heard in recent months, I have experienced a few significant life uh, changes. Uh, last summer, my number one and only son, Drew, uh, married the love of his life, Lily, and they began their uh, life together. And I thought, well, that, that looks good. And so in January, after a whirlwind 24-month courtship, uh, I got married uh, to Miss Margaret Wynn, lately of Raleigh, North Carolina. Uh, we in the chapel over at WKU. We spent a week in Greece for our honeymoon after I was on mission there. And then we set about figuring out this new life we have of putting these, these two households together. I've never in my life had a debate about who had the best spatulas, but we had that. Um, and uh, figure out who can do what. And uh, it's been a lot of fun. Then we decided that wasn't enough. So we decided, well, maybe we'll remodel our house or, or sell that one and buy a new one. And so, so we decided that. I blame all this on, on Bill Way. We're just three months into our wedding. But Bill, who performed our wedding, uh, pronounced over us that we would have many, 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 many adventures. And so we just started and, uh, and we're, good, we're good to go. Uh, while surprising and delightful, though, none of these things were completely unplanned. Serendipity is great. Uh, but many of the best things in life are planned before they are lived. So I wonder for you, what's the best adventure you've ever planned in your life? Maybe it was your wedding. Maybe it was a remodel of a home. Maybe it was your dream vacation. Maybe a, a career change. Maybe a significant lifestyle change with, with, uh, with diet or exercise. Maybe your retirement. <laughs> uh, okay, I got a different question for you. What's the best adventure you've ever experienced in your life? Because those are not the same, you know. There's the plan, and then there's the living of the plan. Some plans take, take this day, start to finish. Make the plan, and you live it. Some take years to realize. They are the defining frame of all of life. But then there are those who make big plans and talk big plans, but never manage to live those out. An unlived plan. It's like a, like a faded post-it note on the refrigerator. It's kind of there as a reminder of what might have been. Many of the 
best things in life are planned before they're lived, but living them requires clear priorities and intentional action. Well, where do we get the impulse to plan things? Well, I think we, we get it from the God who made us. The God who spoke creation to being and then created us and said, I'm going to make you like me. And so we're drawn to plan because God plans. God doesn't just plan creation. He plans all things. Every single life in here, every single life on the planet, every second of human history is woven into God's sovereign plan. It's a plan He intends for us not just to know, but to, to live what it means. And so we've been exploring over these past months life in the kingdom of God, the kingdom of God, the rule and the reign of God over all things for the pleasure and the glory of King Jesus. And God's kingdom plan is built on is very carefully designed plan. It is to bring glory to himself by searching and, and rescuing rebel sinners so their lives are transformed, they're adopted into his family, their eternal destinies are changed forever from, from hell to heaven, so that in all of this, much is made of King Jesus. And since the beginning of the year, we've been walking chronologically through the Bible to see how God's plan for his kingdom develops and what our role is in it. So we began by talking about exploring the plan of the kingdom of God in the Old Testament. We began with creation. We saw the fall and how human beings rebelled against God. And then begin to see throughout the Old Testament how it was unfolded. There were promises made of a king who would come. One who would come, who would crush Satan. One who would come, who would rescue rebels and would come through a Messiah. Who would come through the family of one man named Abraham. Who became a nation named Israel. And the line of King David and the prophets spoke of this. But today we want to begin exploring How's the plan of the kingdom of God unfold through the, through the New Testament? What we're going to see here is where there were promises made in the Old Testament. There were promises kept of the king who came in the New Testament. And so we're going to begin by walking through the Gospels, these four unique perspectives, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, these unique perspectives on the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus. If you read the Gospels, you'll see that after the birth narratives, there's a long period of silence about details about Jesus' life until you get to about uh, age 30 when he begins his public ministry. In the Gospel of Mark, here's what Mark said. He said, Jesus came into Galilee proclaiming the gospel of God and saying, the time of, is fulfilled, the kingdom of God is at hand, repent and believe in the gospel. Now what Jesus is saying is, what you've been looking for, what you've been waiting for, what you've been longing for, what the prophets told you was going to happen, has happened. It's here. The kingdom of God is breaking into our world, into our time. And so as we follow through the Gospels, we'll see that through Jesus' teaching and Jesus' actions, how those things are meant to shape who disciples are as people and how we live as citizens of the kingdom of heaven. The best known of Jesus' teachings is the Sermon on the Mount, it's recorded in the Gospel of Matthew. If you have your Bibles, go ahead and turn there to Matthew chapter 6. The sermon is actually in Matthew 5, 6, and 7. We're going to be in chapter 6. And you know, the Sermon on the Mount begins with, with these Beatitudes. Blessed are, right? There are, there are statements that are, this summer we're going to spend a lot of time leaning into each one of those. Such a rich time we're going to have there. And it kind of is the they set the tone for the entire Sermon on the Mount. Because in the sermon, Jesus is describing the character, the values, the actions of the people of the kingdom, the, those who are living out God's place in the world. And he's saying this way of life in the kingdom is upside down from the way the world thinks of it. It's upside down from the way your religious traditions have taught you. You've heard it said, but I say to you. And, and it's intensely practical. He talks about things like, like anger and lust and marriage and divorce and conflict and enemies and money and religious things like giving and, and prayer and fasting. But in Matthew 6, Jesus turns his attention to anxiety and worry about the basics of life, about food and clothing and shelter. And two times he says, hey, don't worry about it. Just don't worry about your life. But but how do we do that? How is that possible? Well, he gives us the answer in Matthew 6. Kipley is going to come and read this for us. Would you stand in honor of the reading of God's Word? We're in Matthew 6. We're going to begin in verse 31. 
Matthew 6, verses 31 through 33. Kipley, go ahead and read that for us. Therefore, do not be anxious, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For the Gentiles seek after all these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them all, but seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. Amen. This is the word of the Lord. Thank you. You may be seated. Good job, Kip. We appreciate that. Thanks, everybody. So he's talking about worry and anxiety over the basic things of life. And when he hears it first, it may seem like an odd suggestion for people struggling with anxiety. Kind of feels disconnected from the emotions or the concerns of the moment. Hey, you're hungry, you're cold, you have a place to live. Seek first the kingdom of God. What? How can a religious proverb help with practical needs? Well, that signals part of our problem. We often hear this verse, verse 33, pulled out of its context. And we treat it as a separate standalone statement. We know it. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things will be added to you. And we hear it as a separate thing. But in its context, what he is saying, it's not just a bumper sticker proverb. A slap on the back of the donkey. It's not what this is, right? Remember, Jesus is describing what it means to live out life and God's plan as a kingdom person. The best things in life are planned before they're lived. But in order to live them, clear priorities and intentional action are required. So for disciples of Jesus, even in the middle of our ordinary stresses of life, our ordinary anxieties and concerns, the best thing for us is to live out God's kingdom plan. He says, make the kingdom a clear priority and then act on it. Well, how do we do that? We're going to take this verse apart and discover exactly how that happens. And the first thing to notice is this, that disciples advance God's kingdom plan when we prioritize the pursuit of the plan. He says, seek first the kingdom of God. Now, the impulse in the word seek there is, is an impulse for action, isn't it? Seek is the idea of movement in a particular direction or, or for a, a certain purpose. Now, we use the word seek, and it's often used in kind of a negative sense as a response to a crisis. So back in the spring of 2019, when, when COVID first popped on the scene, we said, oh, we're gonna, we have to seek for a cure and a way to do this. It was a crisis. We're going to respond to that. A few weeks ago, my, uh, my, my new daughter-in-law, Lily, called and, and asked us to come over quickly because uh, Liam the cat had gotten out. <laughs> she came home from work, opened the door, Liam skirted out. Liam's an inside cat, not an outside cat. Skirted out and went between some houses. So as dusk was falling in the evening, we went to look for Liam along the fence rows where we were. Have you ever called a cat and expected a cat to come? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Flashlights, looking everywhere. Um, Liam eventually did come home, but not until the next day. Um, but, but understand, seeking the kingdom is not like that. Seeking the kingdom is not a search for a lost thing. It's not an endless search for the, some spiritual golden ticket. It's not about what we don't know or what we don't possess. Because through his word and through his son and through his people, what we've already seen in the Old Testament, God has gone to great lengths to make his kingdom plan known. It's not hidden. It's in plain sight. When we say seek first, what we're saying is we're going to settle as the priority, the primary direction of our life and the energy of our life is to live out the heart and the values and the goals of Jesus and his kingdom. To say, this is what I'm living for. This is what defines my days. Now, Jesus made this very clear when he called his disciples. He said, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. He says, of all the possibilities of how you could direct your life, put aside all the other possibilities and put me at the head of the line, the first on your list. Put aside all the possibilities and follow me in the, take up your cross, which means to lean into the mission of God, what God has, and follow me. To go where King Jesus goes, at the time that he goes, at the pace he goes, in the direction he goes, to or with the people he goes with, uh, in the way that he goes, the reason that he goes. It's an ongoing daily thing. Every single day, as soon as our eyes open, we have to decide, today my priority will be 
to follow King Jesus, to live out his kingdom plan. So there's nothing passive about pursuing the kingdom. The Bible knows nothing of, of spectator disciples who watch what God's doing from the sidelines, kind of golf clap a little bit, smile, kind of give the thumbs up when our team does something good. No, that's not there. It takes intentional action to make the main thing of my life, the main point of my life at every moment is extending the borders of the kingdom into me, into you as disciples, in, and everywhere God has placed us in the world, to expend energy and, and courage in that way. Now, now it's, it's, a, it's a tough thing, and all this is tied together to what we're living in. Because the world is a dark and difficult place in homes. We've already talked about this morning. There are tough moments. There's anxieties and concerns, and there's pain and confusion. There's fear and conflict and immorality and injustice and death and grief and abuse and wars and, and sin. And people are in it. They're submerged in trying to make their way through it. But King Jesus has a plan to liberate people from that mess. So how's that possible? There's so many people, 8 billion people on the planet, so much pain. And in the middle of all those 8 billion people, he has people like you and me scatter in the middle of it to whom he has said, seek first the kingdom. Make this the direction of your life. And he also said to you, oh yeah, as you go, remember, you are the light of the world. Not just you have a light, but you, you are the light. You ever, you, ever had, you ever had the power go out in your house in a storm? Everything goes dark, and you scramble for a minute to find where the candles are and how you're going to do those kind of things. The candles you never use any other time, but when the power goes out, you will light the candles. As you light the candles and you begin to move through your house, what you find is that you can take, you can take one step, and the light vanishes. And you take another step, and, and, the, and the darkness vanishes, and the darkness is pushed back. And you take one more step, and the, the darkness is pushed back, and you see a little bit more. And no matter where you go, the darkness is pushed back every time the light appears. Well, that's the plan. God says, when my disciples step into the world seeking me as their priority, the first step we take and lean into that direction with the priority of God's kingdom and his rule and reign to take it where we go, that the, the darkness is pushed back wherever that moment is. And so you take one step more into you, into your own wounds, into your own sin, into your own fleshliness with his light and his, his heart, and, and the darkness is pushed back. You take one more step into the environments where you live, where you work, where you learn, where you play, all those things. And wherever you go, if you're there as a kingdom person, the darkness is pushed back and the light has come. You take one more step into relationships with people that you know, some who know Jesus, some who don't know Jesus at all. But when you're there, the reality of the kingdom becomes alive because you put it first. Take one more step into your circumstances, into your concerns, into your difficulties, into a world that is a mess. This is his plan, is what he has. And here's what he says in the scripture, that this light he's put in you is the light of Christ, which is the light of the world. And he says, and the light shines in the darkness and the darkness will never put it out. The darkness will never overcome it. The light of the world, the light of Christ in you and me will never be able to put out, be, 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 be put out by the darkness of the world that is around us. So you see, prioritizing God's kingdom plan means that we, we commit to give our primary energy our primary direction of life, that we're going to lean in with the light first. We're going to lean in first with the light of his life in us. And so if I'm going to advance the kingdom, I must prioritize, uh, my prioritize the pursuit of the plan. But then also I need to prioritize the person of the plan. He says, seek first the kingdom of God. 
Now, every kingdom has certain component parts. There are boundaries to a kingdom. There are subjects of a kingdom. There are laws of a kingdom. But the most obvious thing is that, uh, that a kingdom always has a king. And the core reality of the kingdom of God is not morality or practices or promises. The key reality is the king. King Jesus is at the center of everything in the kingdom of God. Now, I wonder what comes to mind when you think of Jesus? What comes to mind when you think of King Jesus? Most of us have a default picture, maybe some, from some favorite Bible story or maybe from some experience. And when you think of him, what do you think of? He's loving and wise and compassionate and, and kind. He's, he's present. He's full of grace and full of truth. And all those things are true. But I got to tell you, sometimes I fear that Jesus has become too small in our minds. He's become too tame in our hearts. He's become too safe. He's like a purring cat in a travel tote that we take where we want to go. But I cannot remind us this morning that our king is not small or tame or safe. Can we stop this for a second and step back and, and behold our king and see him for who he is? The scripture says this, that by Christ all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, where the thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things were created through him and for him. And he is before all things, and in him all things hold together. God's power was at work in Christ when God raised him from the dead because it was impossible for death to keep its hold on him. He is seated at God's right side in the heavens, far above all rulers and authorities and power and dominions, above every power and name, not only now, but in the future. God put everything under Christ's feet and made him head over everything in the church, which is his body. The apostle John saw him and he said his eyes were like a flame of fire. His feet were like burnished bronze refined in a furnace. His voice like the roar of many waters. In his right hand he held seven stars. From his mouth came a sharp two-edged sword. His face like the sun shining in full strength. He said, I saw one like a slaughtered lamb standing with wounds in the midst of the throne. And on his head are many crowns. He has a name written on his robe and on his thigh, King of kings and Lord of lords. Behold, he says, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has conquered. Brothers and sisters, this is our King Jesus. He is beautiful. He is ferocious. He is kind, he is merciful, he is strong, and there is none like him. The whole point of the Christian faith, the whole point of the kingdom is to know him and love him and obey him and make much of him. But I gotta tell you that many today, many even who call themselves Christians and many who are not, really, really want the blessings of his kingdom. They want the good morality. They want peace. They want loving relationships in their home and their communities. They want freedom from evil and right to win out over wrong and injustices to be taken care of. They want all the blessings of the kingdom, but they're not at all interested in the king. Brothers and sisters, that's not an option. You don't get the blessings of the kingdom without the king. When we prioritize the kingdom of God, we submit all we are and all we have and all we hope to King Jesus and his purposes in the world. Why? Because the plan of the kingdom of God is Jesus. Where I sang at the beginning of our worship time together, hope has a name. His name is Jesus. God's kingdom plan has a name. His name is Jesus. And in the end, the only one in the spotlight 
will not be a nation or a political party or a celebrity or a law or a statute or an individual or a group. No, at the name of Jesus, every knee will bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth. And every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, that he is king to the glory of God the Father. This is our king. So we're going to prioritize him. We prioritize the pursuit, make him the direction of our lives, the person of the, of the king. And we're going to center our lives and submit to him. But we're also going to prioritize the practice of the plan. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. You see, every king has authority to establish a standard by which everyone under his rule will live. You can call it expectations or commitments or responsibilities of citizens, but in, in every kingdom, uh, what's done in the kingdom will always match what the king desires. In the kingdom of God, those Commitments and expectations and responsibilities are called righteousness. It's a really important biblical concept. It has its roots in a legal term, that which is right, you hear the word there, that which is right as measured by a particular standard, usually a, usually a law or a statute is what the king wants. And here what it says is, it is the king and his God's Righteousness. In other words, what we're talking about is that which matches God's perfect standard of that which is right and good and holy and true. God expects every citizen of his kingdom both to be righteous and to live righteously, to fully match his perfect standard. Only righteous people who match his perfect standard get in and can show that they belong to be in. Now, immediately begin to feel the pinch of that, don't we? I do, because I know who I am and I know what I do. I know myself all too well. I know what's inside me at times. I know that people outside call me reverend and I'm not. I know what's going on inside of me and I know there's times when I can't describe any of that as, as righteous. How can I possibly live that way in a way where I can be in his kingdom with that kind of a perfect king? Well, we got to understand the Bible uses righteousness in two ways and both are crucial for living the plan. First of all, righteousness is what I desperately need to have a relationship with the king. You know the bad news, you heard it before. We're all sinners. We all choose to go our own way. The Bible says in Romans, none is righteous. No, not one. So, so none of us on our own meet God's perfect standard, which means that barring a miracle, none of us gets in. We can't do it. We can't act enough, do enough, perfect enough, become acceptable enough to get in or be in. We got to have a miracle. And a miracle is what we just celebrated at Easter. The life, death, and resurrection of Jesus. Because Jesus, you see, lived the life we would not live. He was perfectly righteous, what God wanted. He died the death we should have died in our place, taking our punishment on himself. And he won a victory we could never win over sin and death and hell. Now, why did he do that? So that we could be forgiven. So that all the marks against us on our heavenly record, our moral heart record, all the things that are said and unsaid, known and unknown, that are not matching God's perfect standard, will be completely erased and taken away so we could be forgiven. But there's even more. Because the Bible says this. God made him who knew no sin, that's Jesus, to be sin for us. That's what happened on the cross when he took our punishment. So that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Now, now, if you've repented of sin and trusted Christ alone for your salvation, that means your name is written in the heaven's book of life. And when they go and check the files, through the files, they find the file with your file in it, and they pull it out and they open it up. It's got your name across the top and your moral, ethical heart records on the inside. And if you're forgiven, it's not just empty where there's nothing. No, what's happened is if you're in Christ, they've gone in now and put in there all the things Jesus did and was to make him righteous are now under my name, under your name. 
under our record in that way, that which matches God's perfect standard. So if you have repented and trusted Christ, your identity, your standing, your position is righteous. That's who you are. That's settled. That, that gets you into the kingdom and you're settled and it's safe and secure forever. So I just got to ask, is it settled for you? Have you trusted Christ alone? Are you still depending on your own goodness, your own morality, your own good neighborliness, your own kindness to recommend you to God? Whatever you're trying, if it's not Jesus, it ain't enough. It's not going to get you in. Fly to Christ. You've got to have him. He alone makes you righteous. So righteousness is what I desperately need to have a relationship with the king But righteousness also is the way I gladly live because I have a relationship with the king. After we're saved, we are to live in a way outwardly that matches who we already are inwardly. That's what he's saying here about seeking the king and his righteousness. The way Paul put it was, live in a manner worthy of your calling. How do we know what to do? How do we know how to live? Well, the king has given us instruction for how to live righteously in the word of God. God's word. God's speaking with perfect love and authority to reveal who he is, what is true, and how to live. This book is not as full of thou shalt not, you shall not, bad, bad person. It's not as to smack your hands. It is describing how God intends human life to work on earth. So when the Bible says in 2 Timothy that all Scripture is breathed out by God and is profitable for training in righteousness, so the man or woman of God may be complete and equipped for every good work, what he's telling you is read God's Word so you know how to live in a way that matches God's standard for life. He'll show you how to do it. He's also given us a model of how to live righteously in Jesus' life. You know, Jesus didn't just walk around in a robe spouting off religious sayings. He lived a real human life. He had family and friends. He had work he had to do. He had emotions that he felt like joy and sorrow and frustration and anger. And he had stresses. He got tired. He faced temptations. And he lived it exactly like God designed it. He lived righteously. So we can follow Jesus' example as he began to live that life. And then he gives us the power to live righteously. He gives us himself. Jesus told us, hey, this righteous life I'm calling you to, it's impossible. You can't do it. Apart from me, you can do nothing, he said. So I'm going to give you the Holy Spirit to live inside of you, and he'll empower you to choose to love me and to choose to obey me. And he'll empower you to live out the difficult things. He gives his power to live out His demands. So prioritizing the kingdom means that I I orient all of my ordinary life from my inner world out, from my thoughts and attitudes, the words I speak, the relationships that I have, the responsibilities I'm involved with, my time, my spending, my voting, my social media, all those things. I'm orienting everything I am around the truths and values of God's kingdom, that which is righteous, which matches His perfect standard. Now you say, well, I, I'm still going to mess up. I've struggled with things. I still do. I know. Me too. We got a flesh inside in the world and the devil is pulling against us. He said, I'm not going to do that perfectly. I haven't done it perfectly today and I'm sitting in church. How am I going to do that? Remember the promise. We know, we recognize that we've walked away from what God wants. The Bible says if we confess our sins. He's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. He'll cleanse us. He'll remind us of who Christ is and what Christ has promised He'll pick us up. He'll dust us off and say, now, go live for me. And you know what? He'll do it in the morning and the afternoon and the evening. He'll do it day after day after day after day until we get home. Because he's going to be with us to help us live this life. It's a different way to live. It's not like the world, but to make your king smile. And then ultimately, what we want to do, we want to prioritize the promise 
of the plan. Remember the context for all this we talked about, we began talking about, was the anxiety and stresses over life. None of this happens in a spiritual and religious bubble. None of this we're talking about today is just for Sundays at just a church with church people. It happens in the bump and grind and stress and demands of everyday life in a jacked up world. And we'll circle back and hear the whole thing. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things will be added unto you. This is a promise an assured outcome given only to kingdom people. Those who commit their life in a kingdom direction, submit to the king, orient their life to God's truth and God's ways. This is not a general thing. God will make it work out and take care of everything for everybody. No, it's just for kingdom people. And if we'll live that way, we can be confident of God's provision. Scripture says this in lots of ways. Peter says this, his divine power has given us everything we need for life and godliness. Paul said, God will supply every need of yours according to his riches and glory in Christ Jesus. God provides our needs. And this is not tied to a particular uh, standard of living or possessions. What we're talking about here is got to work for disciples in Bowling Green and disciples in Bangladesh and disciples in, in Athens, and disciples in Bangkok, and disciples in Mogadishu. It's got to, it's got to apply to all disciples in all those places. So it's not tied to any particular thing. So what do we really need? We need food, shelter, clothing, and whatever else is necessary for us to live out our part of his kingdom plan right now. His kingdom plan, right? Search and rescue rebels, transform lives, eternal destinies, make much of Jesus. The bottom line is this, the king promises to give us the things of earth to enable us to live the life of heaven, to live the life of the kingdom. Now what any disciple needs beyond those basics, food, shelter, and clothing, is unique to that disciple and their time. And it's a wide variety of possessions and opportunities and influences and relationships. But the promise is this, if I needed to be faithful, to know the king, make him known, make a kingdom ha impact, I'll have it. If I don't, I won't. And I'll have it in his time, perfectly on time. Prioritizing the kingdom means I can rest from anxiety and trust my king because he promised to provide and our king never, ever lies. So we ask you, is God's kingdom plan the defining priority of your life? Knowing and treasuring Jesus, joining his search and rescue mission, investing to transform lives and destinies, making much of King Jesus. What evidence is there that that's your first thing, your one thing? We've kind of given you some ways to look at that. Maybe for you, it's about committing to put that first, make it the defining thing of your life, to define your days. There's lots of things you can put on the list, right, of ways to order your life. Maybe this morning is a good time for you even to reorder those things, right, to make sure that this really is the first thing. Maybe for you, Maybe Jesus has grown a little soft and fuzzy. He's a nice example, a nice moral person. Maybe that. Maybe you've lost sight of his majesty and strength. Maybe for you, to make him first means you need to submit to King Jesus as he is. Maybe for the first time that you've ever bowed your knee and submitted to trust him for your eternal destiny. Or maybe just to be reminded again, King Jesus is first. You need to revision who he is to you. Maybe you think about the things you do and you think, I don't think those things are matching up to God's perfect standard of what's good and right and true and holy. And you need to, you need to, to orient those things back to his standard. You know what we call that? We call that repentance. Maybe you need to, to come and repent of something and just say, I need to put that behind me and step forward into something else. 
maybe in the midst of all of this, I'm trying, I'm trying, I'm trying, but the anxieties of life are weighing me down. Maybe you need just to trust your king to provide and release that anxiety. So I'm going to ask our care leaders that they'll go ahead and make their way down here. If you're one of our care, we're going to have men and women across the front up here as we finish up today. And as they begin to make their way down here, if you want to come and, and, and pray with someone, have someone pray with you about any one of those things or anything else, or you want to come here and kneel and pray, you can do that. We'd love for you to do that. Talk to someone about that. Begin to lean into that. Many of the best things in life are planned before they're lived. And living them requires clear priorities and intentional action. There's nothing better or more lovely or more glorious or more important for a disciple of Jesus than God's kingdom plan. So brothers, sisters, we've worshiped together this morning. That's great. Now we're going to live in the middle of a world that's a mess. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And all these things will be added to you. And King Jesus will be seen beautiful, lovely, and clear. Live that this week for his fame. God bless you. Thanks for being here this morning. Come and pray if you need to this morning. Thanks for being here. God bless you.